And we got the red dot. So we are ready to go. <clears throat> and uh, I'll talk a little bit about our firewood study that we're doing. And uh, this is just a, a talk here. I've been, Ed Chasa, is Ed in the room? Where's Ed? Ed's not in the room. Ed Chasa is in charge of grants at the Wood Education Center. And he's the guy who got the funding to do this and the firewood review that I'm doing. So I work for NC State, and Ed gave me a pile of money. And the way NC State works, like all colleges, whether it's Clemson or anybody, West Virginia U, is uh, they get their overhead, and that's fine. They, they've got expenses for keeping up with people like me. So. It gives me a pile of money and they take about a fourth of it for overhead and then I get the rest to pay my salary, pay the card, and, and some expenses. So with my expense money, I bought a nice video camera and some cards and some other devices like backup drives. And my goal is to visit 20 firewood processors. And I visit some of the folks in the room and I greatly enjoy that. And what we do is we lay out anywhere from 20 to 50 logs based on how many you're going to cut and what's going on. I try to get as many as I can, but I got to get done in a day. So I'll go out usually in the morning or the afternoon before and I measure each end of the log. I get the length of the log. I get the species. And then I set my camera up close to the processor and I watch them go through it. And I'm, trying, I'm doing an industrial engineering study. And if you know the history of engineering, where did industrial engineering really get its start? Who knows that? Frederick Taylor, up in, up in the steel industry, went around trying to optimize the work. And he was, he was a fanatic on trying to figure out how do people work. So they would be shoveling coal, and he would go in there every day with a different size shovel and see what worked best. And his whole thing was he tried to improve the productivity so the company made more money and they would divide the benefit among the employer and the employee. He was not a slave driver. He didn't want anybody working to death. So he would always try to fix uh, or improve and encourage employers and employees to work together for the benefit of everybody. But what he figured out is if you can get a 20% productivity gain, 30%, 50%, 100%, then that made the companies more productive, more competitive, and that's the struggle we have in the firewood industry. Every firewood industry, I've ever, every business I've ever seen struggles somewhere from start to finish. I've not found the perfect one yet. So I go in and sometimes I, I, I get free advice and I'll say, you know, I, I come into your place and I think your conveyor could go faster or slower or this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes they try it. And I visited one earlier this year. And uh, one of my things, I, I worked in a furniture plant as an industrial engineer. So I go around with stopwatch and video camera and measure stuff. And one of the work things you learn in engineer, industrial engineering is you don't want people working below their knees and you don't really want their hands above their shoulders, right? So you got this work zone is where you need to be. And if you're above it or below it, you're inefficient and you're wearing your workers out. So when I go into a firewood business and they've got a basket and it's got a swing door and all that stuff falls on a dirt floor or a concrete floor, to me that's a red flag. Something needs to be done. So I, I, I was visiting with this unnamed company and uh, the owner thought, hey, that's a pretty good idea. And he's a, a partnership, so he thought it was a good idea. I didn't, I didn't meet the other partner for him. I did the idea, but I didn't really deal much with him. So I, I said, you know, anything you do to get the wood off the floor would help. So we kind of talked around, and he was dumping the wood on the floor in a concrete building like this. And the people were picking it up off the floor and wrapping it with a machine like the wrapper you saw out there. So from an industrial point of view, throw the red flag, right? It, it, it's, it, it's not too good. So he said, well, I got some old lumber. What if we made a table? And if, what if we put a slide so we could put like five buckets of wood and the person could work at this height right here, getting the wood to go in the bone. 
in the bunker. And he said, well, I'll give that a try. So he, he had the old lumber laying around, and one day he built one that was 20 feet wide because he had two bunkers. And it was kind of great because the guy that was running the six skid steer in the bucket could put like five buckets of this wood there, right? And it's all at a good working height, right? So is this a win-win situation, mm -hmm. right? We're better for the employee, we're better for the company. And one of the questions I said was, you know, how many bundles a day does a person usually do? So he gave me a number. So, and he sent me some pictures of it that I'm not going to show. And uh, away he went. So I was expecting really good results, right? Uh, guess what the results were? The results were the other partner didn't like it, so he took it out. Oh, man. <laughs> so now, now they're still back where they were working off the floor. And I, and I said, well, why would he not like it? He said, well, he just doesn't like change. You know, if we're doing it one way, we don't like it. You know? But it was funny that one day I was working with him. The guy they had doing the work was complaining. He was as old as I was. And nobody my age, which is 61, needs to be working on the floor picking up sticks of wood. And the other problem with bundle wood is you have to pay attention to the pieces of wood because you're making the bundle. You put a big piece here, a little piece there. You need a selection. Otherwise, you're wasting time trying to find the right piece of wood. So let's just pick a number that with, now where is the owner of that wrapper out there? Brandon, Brandon here? If I've got a wrapper like the one out there, how many bundles should I do in a day, right? Who's got a number? 200, 150, 100, 140, 140, pick a number, 140. I expected a good number, right? If he's doing 200, I expected 250, 300, right? Well, I never got a number because they took it out. So it was a, a disappointment there. But there's always some kind of a factor that screws up every good idea you have, right? <laughs> But that's just um, a story. I mean, I give out free ideas. I mean, I, I, I try to be helpful. And, and not everybody wants me to come to their place, and that's fine. We've got plenty of places to go. I'm working in five states, the Carolinas, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia. And Ed with, uh, if you haven't met Ed, where's your hand at, Ed? You're here somewhere. There's Ed. He is the grant administrator. So he came down today to monitor that you guys actually showed up <laughs> and that we're actually doing all the things. To get a grant from Ed, I have to promise to do great and wonderful things. Which you do. Which I, I mean, <laughs> try hard, because these grants are hard to get, let me tell you. There's a lot of people that want them, so you got to promise a lot and you got to do even more. So I'm grateful for this. We need another grant to do this workshop in a new location next year, and I hope we can do that. Because uh, I really enjoy it, and I think we're making progress networking the industry and bringing good ideas out for everybody. And by the way, Stephen, I need to tell you, if you want to sell your walnut logs, go to, you know the fellas over at Lincoln that have the walnut sawmill? I think it's like American Walnut. It's on the west side, it's on the Cat Square Road here, west of uh, Lincoln. And they buy, all they cut is walnut. So if you got walnut logs, they would be interested. So that's the networking thing that we do here. So the story is I show up either the day before or in the morning. And Richard, who was gone, I was up at his place at Culpeper, Virginia, seven degrees in the morning, seven degrees above zero. And his hydraulics weren't working. It was too cold. So I go back the next week to another place and it's 20 degrees right before Christmas we had a big cold spell. It's a good time to sell firewood. So basically I go out when it's hot and cold. I measure my logs, lay them out. I give them the high sign, set my camera up and away we go. So really when I'm filming, I'm filming very close to the saws and in my view I've got a big digital clock that's helping me keep up with the time. So I'm looking at how many seconds it takes to load a log, move a log, and go through. And sometimes I run across people that are very productive. I spent one day at a place and we only cut 23 logs in about four hours. And uh, I really got bored on that one. So some days are, are better than others. But basically what I try to do is I'm collecting information, looking at what's good and what's bad about running these processors. I'm not looking at whether brand A is better than brand B. 
because it, it is so dependent on what you're doing. If you're running a firewood business and you're doing bundle wood, you're going to be splitting small pieces of wood. You may be resplitting them on the processor. And it makes a big difference what kind of wedge you have, whether it's a six-way wedge, four-way wedge, what kind of customer. If you want to bust wood fast, use a four-way splitter, make big pieces of wood, and never resplit anything. Some places I go, it seems like they're resplitting on every block because it's a real art and science in trying to make your product with what you have to work with. And in firewood, we almost never have perfect logs. You know, our logs are not perfectly straight. Uh, usually on our wood, we're trying to get a deal, right? So we're not necessarily optimizing the volume of wood through the processor. We're trying to optimize making money. So if we can get a good deal on logs, a lot of times we get imperfect logs. But a couple of things that I want to mention is uh, a lot of people don't like bucking their logs when they're crooked. And I've been to several, I've been to about 16 operations and only one of them had a bucking saw at the front end, at the uh, a grapple. Now in the logging industry, typically at a logging yard right next to a road when you're loading the logs out, you have a bucking saw. And you're gonna take maybe a tree length log and you'll buck it for whatever you're doing. But if you had one of those at your firewood business, then you can buck those crooked logs real quick. And the trouble is, processors don't handle crooked logs very well. They don't feed well. So what happens is, here you are, you've got a machine that might have a two, three, four, five, six second cycle, but the operator's got to stop, get out of the cab, walk around with a cant hook, try to twist this crooked log around for a, uh, some way to grab it into the processor. And you can lose ungodly amount of time with a crooked log. But everybody gets tired of taking the chainsaw and walking around and cutting it up, right? The yard guy doesn't want to do it. This processor guy doesn't want to do it. So we just tend not to do it often enough. So it's a, a huge loss of time on the processor dealing with crooked logs. And, and really, if you, do ha if you do unload your logs with a knuckle boom loader and then have that knuckle boom loader load the processor, Putting a buck saw that works off the hydraulics of the grapple is a great way to go. And that's not new technology, it's very old, it's been around, we know how to do that very well. And all the equipment offer, all the equipment dealers that sell forestry equipment sell them. So if, if you're thinking about, well, what can I do to help this problem, crooked logs, bucking them into crooks so you have two, two short straight logs instead of one long crooked log. Another problem people have is when you buy a processor, unfortunately, any piece of equipment has limitations. So if you buy a 14 inch, I mean a 14 foot saw, 16 foot saw, 20 foot saw, they're all optimized for that length or less. They don't like something that sticks six and eight feet longer than what the processor really is made for. So a lot of times you end up with feeding problems because the log is just too long doesn't work so well. The other extreme you run into is logs that just barely fit in or logs that have knots and extensions that hang up. Now most people running processors like to run the big end first. And why do we do that? When you get down to the end and you use that last piece it doesn't flip over if you don't have the tray table. Well, that's, if you got the tray table it don't always work. That's right. Well, so what what Steven's saying is that uh, when you get down to the last piece, it's out of balance. We got tapering logs, so if you run the big end first, you have to watch. I mean, if you run the little end first, you have to watch it, is what he's saying. Where I see it is mostly if you think about your limbs that grow up, if you don't uh, cut the limb off close and you leave a, a, an extension of that limb, it gets hung up a lot of times as you come through. So most people tend to like to run the big end first. The good thing about that, if you're close to your capacity, you find out real quick whether it's going to make it or not. And you can back it up and kick it off or cut it off or something. But anytime you stop the processor from running through, you know, you're not making firewood. 
And another issue you run into with the processors is jams. And jams, you tend to have more jams with bigger logs. You have more jams if you've got a lot of knots and a defect wood. A lot of times when you buck logs in the field, especially with urban logs, people will include the fork in the end of the log, and that really boogers the processor up. If you can buck it when it's straight and not flared out, it runs through the processor better. But it's real hard a lot of times if you're getting free logs from the arborist. I mean, they don't, they're not gonna buck these logs to suit the firewood guy, right? They're gonna do what they need to do. And if you know anything about the arborists, a lot of times they're hanging in the trees with ropes or they're on buckets. They're at awkward angles trying to trim that tree. So when you get it as the firewood guy, uh, it's not optimized for you, you know? So it's a, what's interesting is when you run the processor, you want them perfectly bucked and trimmed and all that. Well, you gotta do that yourself. <laughs> I mean, the loggers can't do that. They're not going to make it perfect for you. So that's a problem. But getting back to the wedges, the, uh, the more splits you have in it, a lot of times, the more jams you have. Uh, I've seen some wedges that had to be wore out 20 years ago. I mean, it's like nobody ever resharpened them, cleaned them up. And anybody that's ever broken a wing off of a, off of a wedge, they don't weld back as good as they were when they were new. You know, you can patch them up. Now, I talk to people that's got theory on the wedge steel, and I don't, I'm not a steel guy, but I was told by one guy that sounded like he knew what he was talking about. When you, when you make a wedge, you want a steel that's got a little flex in it because we're slamming this pretty hard. If you've got a brittle steel in there, you have more problems. Does anybody believe that? Okay, I don't know that, but I've heard that. I think it's harder on the outside, softer in the middle, or something like that. Yeah, I think there's, other way around. there's a lot of theories on these wedges, and I don't know them all. I was hoping maybe Marcus would smarten me up a little bit, because he's yeah. and the other guys that are here. Uh, I'm sure each of these companies has a, a guru and a scientist that works on wedges. But it's interesting. I was at one place. And my, when I do these films, I stay out of the way. I let them do what they want to. But one day they had a, this, this company was running. And what happens a lot of times when you're the operator, you get fatigued, you get frustrated. And if you have a wood like oak and you let it get crossway in the wedge, you need to stop and back off. You got to resist the temptation to slam the ram in there and try to push it a piece of oak crossways through the wedge because it won't do it. It jams it up. And the operator jammed this one up. So I'm back out of the way and I'm trying to go home. I'm down to the last three logs and it's a three hour drive to go home and I'm tired, okay? And he jams it and he's over there working on it. Well, I don't say nothing for 15 minutes, okay? Then it's 30 minutes. It's 45 minutes. After an hour, I went up and got the sledgehammer and started beating on it. And I got it out, okay? I just, uh, you know, I just said, well, you know, it's obvious this was the longest log it ever took to split, right? You spend an hour trying to get the jam out. So you, uh, you do have to be careful. You have to be smart to run a processor. It's a skill by occupation. And you can't let frustration happen to you and you're going to jam a lot. Another thing that happens on these processors, for some reason, a lot of them drop down very well. You saw it, it drops right into place and away you go. But a lot of them get turned sideways and you got to flip. And the last piece is very problematic, how it falls and it gets in there crossways, so you got to stop and get to it. <clears throat> Machines that have cabs, you got to get out of the cab and you got to lean through the window. And a lot of guys use a stick that's got a sharp hook on it. I don't know, what, what do you call something like that? A pick a pick a a a pick. Pick. We call them tiger hooks. Tiger hooks? Well, you need one, you know, because there's no need to dig yourself into the thing if you can take a stick and not have to bend. From an engineering point of view, if you can do it with a stick, that's better than doing it. But if it doesn't happen at all, and there's several variations. Now, if you went out back, one of the machines out there 
has a trough that moves, and that's unusual. Most, most people have drag chains, and that works better with straight logs than it does crooked logs. So everything you do to improve the quality of the log helps you get wood through the machine. And really what you want is just this little simple routine where everything always works, right? So you have to use operator training, operator motivation. Uh, it may be a good idea to have some incentive pay in these operations. And that's where the measurement, I think, is a good idea. Where people benefit, the more wood they can get through the process or more of the wood that's done correct, correctly, the more money you're making, then maybe we can pay people more. And, and that's where we're trying to go. So the, this study's not complete, but when, it, when it's done, uh, I think we'll know a lot more about it. Because what I'm going to do, first thing I'm doing now is, is getting all the data. And then I got to analyze it. So with my clock, I can see the time per log. So I know every log what the cubic volume is. And we'll be able to do graphs and other things looking at the diameters and the length of the log and species and so forth. And just see what all these numbers are. And like I say, each operation is so unique. This study is, is not going to say, well, this brand is better than that one, or this one, or that one, or whatever. But it's going to be interesting to see what it, when it comes out, it'll say, well, this operation had a bar saw and it had a 40 horsepower diesel engine, and we'll see what that is. I mean, we're not going to really, in this study, say what the machines were or where the business was, but we will be charting things like species and horsepower and wedges and anything else. Because it's a big deal what you're making with your machine. Big wood, little wood, how much re-splitting. Uh, a couple of the operations I've been to have uh, that's making bundle wood, you need small splits. So one of the questions you have to do is what's the, the most efficient way to re-split wood? You got a piece of wood that's too big for your bundle, what are you going to do? So what does people do? Pick it up, put it back. Pick it up, put it back, but that reduces the amount of wood you can get through, right? Yeah, I can't saw a whole piece and cut it eight times. I can only cut that one again. Right? Yeah, you can go back through. Some people, there's a. Go ahead. We make sure to split the right when we 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 split it right there on the processor. Put on top of the wedge. If it's too big, just throw it right back, right then. Don't let it go to the conveyor belt until it's the right size. Another thing that some people do is there's a a kinetic split called the super split. Everybody familiar with super splits? Mm -hmm. They're a kinetic splitter and what's they're faster than hydraulic splitters. Because what you have is a flywheel and then when you engage it, boom, it throws it through. So when you're resplitting wood, you're not splitting the whole block, you're only resplitting one piece. So the kinetic splitter is faster than hydraulic to redo it. But I want to show a couple photos. This is the uh, my first woodwork, my first firewood operations, 2004, and this is a, a bundle firewood guy who has a very large, uh, he had a cord keg in there in this building, and he goes up on the conveyor and drops it into these pipes. Now, I don't know exactly, he, he, he has, he had the most capital intensive firewood operation I've been to. This is what he did. He had a dry kill that's behind us. Here's his baskets ready to go in, and they would double stack them to go through the kill. But I thought I'd show these because I don't want to show photos of people. And this is kind of a mix match. Now, see this lady's got a hydraulic splitter. She's doing the resplits with hydraulic splitters. And you know how fast they go. So the kinetic ones would be faster than these. And they have a woodpacker here, and they were doing about 3,000 bundles a day at the time. They didn't do 4,000 to be profitable. They're doing three. So these ladies are taking the wood. They're picking it off. So from an engineering point of view, this isn't that bad. You're working at waist height, right? And by having this conveyor belt moving slowly, the speed of this conveyor needs to be such that it runs the whole time. But it's just fast enough that they don't have to stop it to keep up. Because what you want in an industrial situation for the most productivity is keep the conveyor moving at a pace that it, they can work all day long and not be fatigued. 
but the conveyor doesn't stop. If you run the conveyor to stop, run the conveyor to stop, that's not as good because you never turn it back on soon enough. So this is this is what I learned at the furniture plant. Is if you start if you start stopping the conveyor, you, you start not getting your production. So these ladies, as you can see, they first put down this shrink wrap bag in the U shape, and they drop the pieces in, and then they fold it over, put the label. It runs through the woodpecker is a shrink wrap uh, propane heated machine and it runs through at a certain speed. So if you put your stopwatch on it or, or look at the time, you can see what the gross output is, is. If the machine runs all the time at the speed it's run and how many bundles you should get. So this is, the Woodpecker is a very common machine out there for, for production operations. So to me, this is pretty good for the most part. This is 2004. And this is what these uh, operations were doing. Another view is like the first person. Uh, I'm looking to see where the. You have to start off with the shrink wrap and it folds back and puts the label in. So it's, it's moving through. You see the roll there at the end. So the, the first lady puts it in. And here's the guy taking the chainsaw and he's cutting the. Uh, the wrap to the right length. So the reason I showed this photo is this company had a problem with moisture. They they dry killed some wood, didn't get it dry enough, it molded and they got it back. So they started doing less full wrapping around it. So if you stop and think about it, if you've got your wood dry, then it's great to uh, to wrap it up and keep it from getting more moisture. But if it's not dry enough to start with, you got to be careful how you wrap it up. So it's a balance between holding that bundle together and allowing it to breathe if it needs to breathe. So here's the guy on the end. He's taking the, the wood out and he's putting so many bundles. Seems like the number 45 is some, some number I remember. But here's these bundles. Now this wrap is pretty much a full wrap. He's not leaving much. The only breathing is out the end of the bundle. So they, uh, they got in trouble with some moldy wood, so they, they tried to let it breathe on the ends as much as they could. So this guy is, is stacking it off. Now one of the things that happens later on, this is the woodpecker running, running through. And they've got a, uh, over here is some reject wood for some reason. And you always have to have a place. If you got wood and it's not going to make your bundle properly, get it out of the way. They threw it in this cart to move it through. Now this is interesting here is they did not have a tumbler for getting out the sawdust and the splinters. But basically, as it came down the line, they picked out what they wanted and what leftover ran off the end and went out the building. That's pretty cool, right? That's, that's good. We give a thumbs up for that. So this is, in terms of automation, this isn't bad. This is the most automated place I've seen today uh, in how they're running theirs. And like I say, if you get the conveyors running at the right speed, then you can set a pace that everybody can work to and people can see how this is working because as the wood comes down, we're making bundles and we're looking for the right piece to make the bundle. So they're able, you're able to see everything. They got a piece too big, they split it right, right there and away they go. So what do you think about this so far? Good. Good. I, mean, I, think, I think it's pretty good. It's, it's better than average for sure. It's better than working off the floor. <laughs> right? I mean, I don't want to work on the floor. I'm too fat. So this is, the wood comes in on the left, it hits this conveyor, and it goes in that direction. So what they did is they have this wall in here to keep dust down. You know, firewood can be dusty. So, I mean, I thought that was a good idea. Just when the wood tumbles down, a little dust may come up. And away you go. So here we go. Another picture there, the same thing. That's the, the waste coming off the end. And there, there ought to be a market for this stuff if you can figure out who, who would find this desirable. Now, I, I think we really need to come up with some wood stoves that can, can burn this efficiently. This is the guy, of course, putting it away. This is the conveyor they weren't using. And this is, this is kind of what bothered me is if the target was 4,000, you're only doing 3,000 got a, a, another line set in idle. You 
better get this thing into operation. The, the thing that happens to you when you have two of them is you don't have to run each one as fast. If you only got one machine doing all the packing, 4,000 bundles for one machine is more, was more than it could do. So I lost the argument and the guy went broke. And here's a lady uh, going to hand wrap this bundle, I mean this skid here. So she ties it off and then walks around putting it on. This just happens to be the log loader. It's, it's interesting, you know, the lumber industry, sawmills and things, they like long end feed decks. You know, if you go to Jim, Jim's in the plywood business up at Old Fort, you got a long deck going into the mill, right? Well, you need to, <laughs> don't answer that question now. I need to talk to somebody else. But usually the longer deck gives you more slop and, and longer's better. But in this operation, uh, they did pretty good here. They had a big circle saw here. Uh, I mean, th th this is fine. This, this is a good operation here. Uh, this is actually the splitter they were using. If you can see the wedges in there, it looks like what a six or eight way splitter, or something like that. One vertical, and then the wings up, and then it's horizontal wings down. So they were trying to get fairly small splits, and they had a lot of it. This was an electric operation three phase power for hydraulic. But you see the drag chain and then that's the, the wood coming through. So they did have some resplits. And as you know, the size of the log and the wedge combination determines how much resplits you have. But unfortunately in the firewood business we're not we don't pay a premium to get exactly the best log for us because it wouldn't be economical. It's it's just too competitive firewood industry for us to get only the optimal ones. And this is, uh, I think, a good thing. The company was selling their solvents, so it was going for boiler fuel somewhere. So really they didn't, other than the, the waste that came off the packing line, uh, this got sold, so it, it wasn't a sloppy operation. So what do you think of this, of this operation here? This is the overhead, so now from an insurance worker comp position, probably the insurance guy didn't like this, did he? Insurance, <coughs> insurance guy didn't want me or anybody else walking around this thing when it was kicking out wood. But basically, you had six or seven stations you could set up to, to drop the wood off. But I don't know if that really did anything for you, really. Because the, dry, the, the, the sawing, was done to match what the dry kill would do in the packing lines, right? So you got a serial operation. You got the sawing, you got the dry kill, you got the packing. So they have to stay in balance. So if this thing can cut three times as much as the dry, dry kill, it doesn't do you much good unless you can develop that market. It did have this side kickoff chute if you wanted to load a truck. How about that? So th this guy invested a lot of money in the early 2000s to be in the fire with this. Any any discussion here on, on this part? Seeing this is it's one thing to talk about it. Here's here's a a fairly automated uh, operation. I don't know how much money he spent. But that's his dry kill back there on the, the back side, and you can see he's got his bundle sitting out there waiting to go in. And he heated his uh, dry kill with propane. That's what he did. Hey, where was his market? He was selling to brokers in the national market. Okay. He was hooked up with uh, the big brokers. Now the broker, I thought treated him fair. The broker <coughs> bought all, anything that he packed, any time of year he took and paid for. Now during the summer, he, he reduced what he paid. He took a couple percentage off because he wasn't moving it right then. But this guy was in a very poor cash flow <coughs> position. So when he produced it, went on the skid, got counted, he got paid in 30 days. So I don't, I didn't have any ill feelings towards the broker. I thought the broker did him very fair. So his problem was he didn't produce it. He didn't get his volume up. He needed 4,000, he was doing 2,000. So he, he did not uh, keep his, if, if this morning we did that break-even curve. He was running below the break-even curve. 
was his problem. And uh, he was headstrong, and I couldn't do anything with him. So in automation, you're, you're looking, I think, at conveyors and layout. What works, I think, good in firewood businesses, like I say, if you can get a location like an, uh, an 84 lumber that closed down and has pavement everywhere, and pole sheds. Uh, firewood, I think, doesn't do so well working out in the open. Now, you know the problem with that, of course, is you're dependent on the weather to work. And uh, if you've got an operation that is fully out in the open and you're not, uh, you can't work in the rain, you can't work at night, it reduces. Now, most of us feel like if you work five days a week, 50 days a year, that's 250 days. But you can probably knock 50 off of bad weather, and that's not so good. So when your, your business reduces because of bad weather, that's not good for you. Uh, so having things in buildings is good. Uh, one of the things on automation, if you stop and think about it, it, it's if this is my conveyor and I'm doing bundle wood and I'm running it say five feet a minute, six feet a minute, and I got people working on it, I can put people on both sides of it. If you saw the one here, it was up against the wall. And had he, if he really wanted to use that second packing line, if he had one on one side and one on the other and maybe one re-splitter on each side, he would have much easier had time to make that work. It wouldn't have cost him any more to do it that way. It was the same equipment. But you can see by putting it up against the wall, it reduced his flexibility. So layout, equipment selection, speeds. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, if you can run your conveyor all day long, you might do 20% more than if you run it and stop it, run it and stop it, run it and stop it. Questions and answers at this time about automation. What's one of my woodpecker problems? I don't know. It's a smart answer. I, mean, I don't think they're unreasonable. Uh, there's more than one brand, but that's the most common brand. They have like five sizes, and the smallest one, the one man machine, is pretty cheap. I think it's, I don't remember, 13000 or something like that. It might be less than that. Yeah, most, a lot of common is the electric assistant <coughs> wrapper. Uh, and there are manual wrappers and, and all things in between. But if you're getting into volume, something in the order of, the woodpecker is shrink wrap, but there's other variations. Some people actually have open head that you can wrap around. So there's a lot of options in packaging. And it, it does make a big difference in cost, whether you do the shrink wrap is more expensive I, than I understand than the stretch wrap. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So it's more expensive, but it's also you got to have the propane to heat it to shrink it. So that costs a little money too. Did he run that packing line? Yeah. Why did he run two shifts? Well, he had he had one there idle that he wasn't using. He would have had to, re to put the second one, he would have had to reconfigure it. <clears throat> well, what I did is, we used the uh, stretch wrap, but we still put a heat gun on it. It still shrinks it just a little bit, but you gotta have a good operator. If he holds it one second too long, it melts it. <laughs> but it does make a tight bundle. Yeah, in the firewood business today, is because we're evolving, you know, you really have to pay attention to it. Uh, I do encourage looking at the YouTube videos, and you'll see good and bad things. You'll do, you'll see smart and stupid. Uh, I saw one. It was some guy decided he wanted to test a different splitting wedge, you know, manual wedge, and he had a sister who was real pretty, and she was helping. Him. But somehow she hit her mouth with that wedge thing with the splitter, and busted the snot out of her lip. I mean, blood is everywhere. So. When you look at some of these YouTube videos, don't do what they do. You know, it's not, it's not smart, it's not safe. Don't do it. But there's a lot of things out there that will get your mind spinning in a different direction. Like I said, 
Sam Walton said every good idea he borrowed from somebody else. Well, what Sam Walton would do is he would take a notepad and go visit a competitor and go sit in his office and ask him questions for hours at a time. And, and a lot of these guys 